Hi everyone, just before we start this week's hedge hopping sortie, little shout out to say that we are on Patreon. If you head to patreon.com forward slash history hack, you can see all the amazing tiers which start from just three pounds a month. We know you all do so much for supporting us and we are ever so grateful for that. But if you're able to give us a bit of help through Patreon, we can keep this podcast going from strength to strength. We all thank you for your continued support. And without further ado, here's hedge hopping. Hello and welcome to History Hacks, dedicated Second World War air power podcast, Hedge Hopping with me, Matt Bone. We tend to put much of our focus, our discussions on the machines that were created for war. We can and usually forget that the most important element of every machine is its human element. And Gaffiuk is a Canadian historian who's created a number of projects that gather the stories of Canadians who went to war many thousands of miles away from home and for many who would never return. Anne's work sheds a fascinating light on individual stories that may have been lost as the years progress. Anne's Typhoon Project, which contains the names and stories of the Canadian pilots who flew the Hawker Typhoon, has been a vital resource for me. It's not the only one that Anne has worked on. So we're going to talk about typhoons in a minute, but I'm delighted to welcome Anne to the show, and we are going to have a wide-ranging conversation that I hope everybody enjoys joys. Anne, how are you? I'm fine. Thank you so much for inviting me to your podcast. Oh, you are more than welcome. You're in my hometown, aren't you? You're over in Calgary. I am in Calgary and it's uh, smoky due to the forest fires in British Columbia, Alberta and Saskatchewan. And uh, it's keeping the temperature cooler, which is a plus, but it's, uh, it's hard for those people with uh, breathing issues and, and such. Um, but it, uh, it it's part of what is happening because um, mm. it, it's it's been warm out your way hasn't it we had a heat dome about three weeks ago that for me was unbearable I can retreat to my basement uh, we don't have air conditioning upstairs was unsleepable and so we had a spare room in the basement so we slept there I, I felt really badly for those who didn't have a basement to retreat to uh, we had fans blowing um, it was just like, it was something we have never encountered before. My mom's 92 and she said she has never experienced in her whole life, the heat coming so soon, so early in the season and lasting like it has, um, it's just unprecedented heat, but it's cool. Now the plus to the smoke is it does keep the temperatures down but um, it's still not a great situation. We need some rain, which is forecast, I think, for Friday. Well, I hope you get it, because smoke is never, never good, especially in, I, I vaguely remember them from, from my youth, and it's, mm. it's nice, but it just gets, gets in your lungs, and it just, oh, no, it's horrible. But let's, let, okay, so as we've, we've done the typically British thing of starting any conversation with the weather, but let's of course let's, we do that in Canada too. <laughs> <laughs> Let, let's let's get on let's get on to your work. So we've got we I have plenty of questions. Um and we're gonna like I said, we're gonna save the typhoons for, for later. But I guess they're gonna come up quite quick because how did you get into all of this? Have you always been a historian? Well, my family on my mother's side um loved and loves family history. Most of us. I have my mother came from a family of eight. My mother's father came from Ontario. My mother's mother came from the United States as children to Alberta, homesteading with um, their families. My, my, mother, my grandmother's um, family came a little late for that. But we've always been interested in our ancestry and, and things like that. My dad came from Ukraine after the Second World War. Um, he, he was very proud of his Ukrainian heritage. So I, I, I really enjoyed learning about history from my parents and my grandparents. Um, and then when I started to, uh, when I was an elementary school teacher, my favorite subject to teach my students was social studies. The pioneer unit in grade three was my favorite. Um, and my second favorite uh, subject to teach was language arts. So combining, <laughs> Combining those two um, disciplines, um, here I am today. Now, when it came to World War II, of course, I learned about it in high school. 
I learned a bit about it in university, but my dad didn't really, my dad was um, taken from his farm in Ukraine as a youth and was forced labor um, for the Germans and never returned to Ukraine. So that was his World War II experience. He shared a few stories, but not a lot. My mother's family, uh, she had an uncle who went to war, but none of her brothers were old enough. My grandfather was a farmer, so he wasn't uh, sent off to war and he would have been too old anyway. So war wasn't a big um, interest of mine. And about oh, 10 or 11 years ago, I decided I was going to write a short story um, or a, a story anyways. And I was going to have a, a young man and a young woman. It was supposed to be a love story. And it was going to be set in Southern Alberta. And he was going to become a pilot. And she was a teacher. And they were childhood sweethearts. So write about what you know. Well, I could do the teacher side of things. But I had no idea about how a young man on the prairies could become a pilot during World War II. So I had to start to research. So I went um, to the Bomber Command Museum in Nanton, Alberta. And uh, the day I went, there was no one there but the docents and me and volunteers. And I had a one-on-one -on -one tour and it was fascinating. And I had no idea what this BCATP was, uh, which is the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan. I couldn't even, I, I was making notes and how do you say that? What are those words? Now I can, I can rattle that off. Uh, I was recommended a few books. Um, I was told to come back. That was in March uh, of 2010. And I was told to come back uh, in July because there was going to be a vintage wings tour, a cross Canada tour of vintage aircraft that would be right up my alley. So I uh, made note of that. And I returned with my mother, one of my aunts and two of my three children to Nanton for the fly past. And um, then we continued on down to Claire's home. And I said to my mom and my aunt and the kids, well, we're going to take a different route home than what we, we got down here. So we took a different side road and ended up at the Claire's home airport. And I didn't know there was such a thing as the Claire's home airport. And it was part of the BCATP I discovered later. And in the, um, the, in the airport were all the vintage aircraft that had landed or had flown over us, they were already parked. And I screech onto my brakes, I back up, we go in there. And my mom and my aunt start talking and they're, they're remembering these yellow airplanes that flew over their farm, uh, north of the city, um, in east of car stairs. And I'm like, Oh, my gosh, like they, they know something about this. So we're walking around and this uh, pilot says to me, or to my children, would your mother like to sit in my airplane? <laughs> <laughs> it was an Anson and I, I didn't know what it was. And I, I said, yes. So I sat in the Anson, the kids got to sit in it. My mom and my aunt declined. Then we saw this old man get in a old airplane and my daughter caught him on her new iPad. And I'm like, there, there's something wrong with this picture. I thought that, that he's too old to be flying an airplane. Like he's just too old. So um, we watched him fly off and we got back into the vehicle and we, we drove home and I phoned um, Tink Robinson, who was the gentleman who gave me my one-on-one -on -one tour. And I said to him, who, who was that man? And he said, Oh, his name is Gordon Jones. And I said, who's Gordon Jones? Oh, he, he's a long time volunteer down here. He owns that air. He owns that airplane. Well, where does he live? He lives in high river. Oh, I said, do you think he'll talk to me? Well, probably. So I, I um, was able to track him down and cold called him, left a message uh, with his wife, never heard back, tried again. And he picked up the telephone and I told him who I was. He had no idea who I was. I told him I was looking to get firsthand information on becoming a pilot during World War II because I was told, Tink Robinson told me, that uh, Gordon was a pilot instructor at number five elementary flying training school, number five EFTS at High River during the war. Well, I just, I struck gold here. So I um, basically invited myself down to his home and I said, um, 
uh, can I come on? Can I come on down? Yeah, that'd be fine. That was his tagline. That'd be fine. I said, I like to bake. Oh, I don't know. He says that that might offend my wife. She might not like that. And I said, no, that whatever I'd bake is for her too. I said, I'm pretty good at making a lemon meringue pie. Well, okay. He says, I said, uh, today's Wednesday. Are you available Saturday? Yes. He said, so I was down there Saturday with my pie, my camera, my notepad, uh, you name it, I had it with me and he was waiting for me. And I, I, I'd like you to think of an image of a king waiting to grant somebody an audience. Well, that was Gordon. He was sitting at his dining room table with everything spread out on his dining room table, waiting for me to start asking him questions. And that was the start of um, me learning about the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan, um, how High River was involved everything like that. And then the guys in, so Tink Robinson knew what I was doing and he was one of the directors in Nanton. And he told the other people down there what I was doing. So I was approached by the Bomber Command Museum in Nanton to write Gordon's biography. And I said, no, <laughs> I've never written a book before. Sure, I wrote little articles for the school board newsletters and stuff, but nothing like a, a book. And they go, well, if we publish the book, would you, would you reconsider? Well, that's another story. I said, let me talk to Gordon. So I phoned Gordon up and he said, that'd be fine. And I said to him, I will get this book before your 90th birthday. So he was 88 at the time. And we had the book published by December, 2012. And he turned 90 in January, 2013. And he passed away in September, 2013. So um, he, he was very open to 95% of his stories. There were some stories he refused to talk about um, and I couldn't press him for those because they were private. Um, his wife was contributing to um, her side of the story, dating you know, a pilot. Um, his daughter uh, had to check me out to make sure I was a a decent person that I wasn't taking advantage of her parents and and I passed muster there uh, she and I are friends still today um, so that's how I got going on aviation history and then uh, Dave Burrell what one of the directors uh, now he's a volunteer there but at the museum he says hey Ann um, you know Gordon's book was such a success here's a scrapbook from World War II can you do something with it so I looked at it and I had my partner photographer with me. I said, Don, would you partner up with me? He says, absolutely. So I wrote a second book based on a woman's scrapbook from Okotoks. Um, and I, the only thing that Dave said to me was, you have to include De Winton, which was an RAF based um, flying training school as well. And I'm like, oh, okay, all right, well, because I was never given any guidance, just write your books the way you want to write them. But with this one, I had to include De Winton. So one of my mother's eldest sisters, she's 98. She worked for the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan on the sixth floor of the Bay downtown as a clerk typist, which I didn't know. And she had, she became a nurse. And she told me that she had friend, a friend named Mary Esposito, who was also a nurse who grew up in De Winton. So I start talking to Mary. Mary says, oh, my mother and I, we, you know, her mom was a widow. She, they hosted people on their property while they built the hangars in De Winton. And then Mary says, I know other people you need to talk to. So she gave me all these names of all these people that I needed to talk to about De Winton. So that book expanded from not just being about the scrapbook. This, this woman kept track of all the local people in the Army, Navy, Air Force, and the RAF from the community. Uh, it was about De Winton. So that was my second uh, foray into learning more about um, World War II aviation history. So... That's, that's kind of how I got into it. And then I, um, when I was doing my research, I was traveling to Ottawa. At the time, Ancestry.ca did not have um, the Library and Archives files online yet. So the only way to access people's files, those who had died, 
um, was to travel to Ottawa. So I've been to Ottawa 10 times maybe over the last 10 years and um, was doing some research for the scrapbook for also for Gordon's book. And I was doing some more research for my, that story that I wanted to write. And I bought online through eBay, a letter written by a pilot during the war. Cause I thought I need to know what these people wrote about. And I bought this letter and Brian Casey is the pilot who wrote this letter to his ex-girlfriend. And inside the envelope were letter uh, were newspaper articles. And I thought, well, I'm going to track this Brian Casey fellow down. Well, he had died in the war and I was able to pull his file in Ottawa, thick, thick file. And inside his file in, in this huge file was one piece of paper with a list on it with his name on it for an accident proneness project. And I thought, well, that sounds like an interesting thing. I could turn that into a book. So with my return trips back and forth to Ottawa, I was able to find the other men on that list. And in fact, I only had had half the list with Brian Casey, but there were um, 16 pilots on this list. And I created a second book um, based on those 16 men, um, tracking down relatives, um, people who knew them, that were still alive. And it was amazing to me with my third book, the effects that World War II still have, the effect that it still has on people living today. They were the brothers of those who died, the cousins of those who died, the children of those who died, and the misinformation they had. Um, and I had to fill in some blanks and, um, I, my brother said to me, you might have to take a psychiatry, psychology course because you're going to have people dealing with so many ghosts. And, I, and I've had people start crying on crying when they're talking to me about their own experiences or um, the loss of a brother or uh, a brother-in-law or their father or their, you know, and um, it just, it was uh, really emotional for me. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I've learned so many stories um, through those three books. Um, to me though, the best stories are firsthand and that's because I, because I had Gordon's stories firsthand. Um, to me, they were the most powerful. Now I, I can go through ancestry.ca online. I can't visit the library and archives due to COVID. Um, mind you, ancestry.ca does not copy the entire file they they whoever selected it did a very select job so um some pieces are missing to the story and that's why i like to visit in person to the library and archives because then i can pick what i want versus what someone else has chosen but still um i'm still able to put people's um stories together and i i hope that they're accurate. Um, with my third book, Quietus, Last Flight, I contacted a niece of one of the men that I wrote about and I sent her a sample chapter and she was upset with me. Um, she didn't like what I wrote about her uncle. And I said, well, I'm just telling you the facts. And the other thing she didn't like was I was, in my third book, I through Gordon Jones, I'm kind of jumping all over the place with Gordon Jones, he opened the world to me through networking. Oh, you need to meet this guy, you need to meet this guy. And then those men would say, well, uh, uh, you need to talk to this person and that person. And, and then those people tell me you need to talk to this person and this person. So as I as the years went on, I, I met I don't know how many World War Two veterans who were very open to sharing their stories with me. And I became friends with them. Um, and some people say it's through bribery, but my baking really opened the door. <laughs> so uh, cinnamon buns, pies, you name it, uh, muffins, cookies, whatever. And um, these gentlemen often were widowers. Um, so they enjoyed a little bit of uh, home baking and uh, my company. They seem to enjoy my company as well. So I asked these men, 
And Gordon had already passed away when I started my third book. So I couldn't ask him because I told him, I said, your job isn't done yet. We've got your book done, but you're not done yet. I'm not done with you yet because I wanted him to give me his feedback on my write-ups of these 16 pilots uh, that were on this accident pronus project. So um, these men were very open to doing it. I had one gentleman, he's a post sec post war uh, RCAF pilot, meticulous in his editing, meticulous. Um, and they're a very valued uh, asset to the book. And um, so he and uh, so he, a pilot navigator, uh, rear gunner of a Lancaster. Um, I had a variety of men who flew these airplanes. Um, they were hot. They were they were hurricanes. They were um, mosquitoes, tiger moths. I mean, the, a variety of different aircraft. Um, so they helped me analyze these stories and that's what the niece back to the niece. She didn't like what some of the, my world war II experts said. And the crew that her uncle was on was very low scoring on most of their tests. And yet they became an air crew and they were inexperienced. And sadly uh, the plane went down and, and they crashed and they died. And um, one of the veterans said they were incompetent and she didn't like that. And I didn't, I said, he's not saying your uncle was incompetent, but, but as a collective group, they just weren't effective. And sadly they, they all perished. So, um, so I, I've had a little bit of controversy, uh, very little, but uh, most people are really keen to learn more about their relatives. So um that, that's kind of a roundabout way on how i've gotten to it's one person to the next to the next to the next to the next so it, it's it's always tricky because families always see their family members and their their grandparents their great uncles in a certain light and training training files are always an interesting thing when you start looking back and 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 seeing some of the scores when someone is not of that pristine above average uh rating it, it's interesting that we've, we've, we've started talking about the um, Commonwealth Air Training Plan because the, the project that you're working on at the moment, uh, the Ottawa Memorial Project, um, is, is specifically dedicated to that. The bit that I found fascinating reading, reading through it is you've started with a quite famous incident, the sinking of the MV America with 32 uh, newly trained crew going down on her as well well um i'm gonna correct you a little bit oh right go for it that's okay that's okay um i had never heard of it before um the america now the only reason i know it's pronounced the america is uh i love i love researching my mother always tells me you like researching more than getting it written well it's now it's a it's a it's an even balance <laughs> i um I visited Ottawa numerous times and I visited the Ottawa Memorial a few times. And I thought to myself, you know, oh, has anyone ever written about all these people's names that are on this memorial? Like there's over 800 names on the memorial. And it, it's for those people who trained in Commonwealth Air Forces. Either they, they died in training or died in, in their operational life that have no known graves. So, yes, some of them were still in the BCATP, but other ones were already fully fledged um, officers or, or leading aircraft men or leading aircraft women or whomever. So I'm only focusing on the Canadians because I can access the Canadian records through Ancestry.ca um, easily. Um, I'd have to travel to England, I suppose, or Australia or New Zealand to, to get access um, to the, the, one, the other Commonwealth um, communities. So, um, so what I did is I went to the book, They Shall Grow Not Old, which is a fabulous resource um, published from Brandon, Manitoba. I'm not too sure how many years ago. And I was gifted a copy of that book by one of my veteran friends. He said, no, I don't need it anymore. You can have it. So, uh, Sandy Sanderson was a, uh, 
mosquito pilot and he was a lovely man who lived in Kelowna. Anyway, this person died in such and such an aircraft or then, oh my gosh, 36 men from the Air Force died on the Amerika. So I, I thought, well, I'm going to start with the men that drowned. I know my mom says, you don't write about very nice things. No, mom, I, I write about everyone who's died. I, I know it's kind of morbid, but it's fascinating at the same time. So I've, I've started to focus on the men that were aboard ships that um, were sunk or torpedoed or through circumstances that are mysterious, they suck. So the Amerika is the first one that I've been working on. And how do I know it's called the Amerika? Is I was able to track down a survivor's family here in Calgary. Cold call. Hi, my name is, I'm doing this. Um, Would you and, like a pie? Yeah, no, I didn't offer him a pie this time around. <laughs> but, um, and, and the man, his father was one of the survivors. And he, he was a pilot aboard that ship and survived. And he says, my dad didn't talk much about the Amerika. And I said, that's how you pronounce it. He goes, that's how my dad always pronounced it was the Amerika. And it's with a K instead of a C. A C. Mm -hmm. So, and I thought, oh, fabulous, fabulous. So again, these are the little, little things I discover as I talk to people. Um, and he said, his dad told him, had it been five or 10 more minutes, there was no way he would have survived. Um, so his father survives, um, and uh, as do, I think, 16 other Air Force uh, officers, 36 parish, as do some of the people aboard the, the merchant marine ship, the Amerika. So uh, and trying to get any merchant marine information is like pulling teeth because they they don't they, they don't release information. Mm -hmm. The merchant marines are very, very closed mouth or they don't have a lot of files because these people were not military, they were volunteered to be part of the merchant marines. Every day on Facebook, I have a companion page on Facebook for the Ottawa page, the Typhoon page and the women's uh, project. And I post one story every day. And I try to write one or two stories every day. So I'm ahead of the game. I'm not falling behind when it comes to posting things. And most men I have photos of, um, some I don't. There are women. Um, I'm thinking after I do the ships, I might jump to the women um, and then go back to the airplanes where the men uh, have no graves. I contacted a fellow in Ottawa and he's interested in the Bahamas. So he said he would write up all the stories related to the men that perished and have no known graves that died in the Bahamas. So I can't wait to see what he does with um, those stories. I find the letters written by the family members to be very insightful. Now, whether those families would want that information shared again, I don't know. It's, it's public information. It's not something that I've made up. I'm just copying. I, I don't pass judgment. I just report it. And it, it for, for me, it's been those, those little snippets that you've got, just being able to say something as simple as someone's eye color is you have a black and white picture of someone and just being able to know they had green eyes or blue eyes or, or brown eyes. It, it it just gives you a little insight into the humanity of the of someone who could be a few hundred words on a on a page and that's as as much as we we may know about their their service and, and their death probably well it often it, they say what they did before um they enlisted and the variety of jobs and of course it was the the depression like think, think economically in canada it was really really depressed uh, gordon jones told me i said to gordon what would when you got your uniform what, what happened to your clothes? He said they threw them in the garbage. They were rags. Mm -hmm. This other fellow I just wrote up, he was struggling with authority. He, he, military life was not for him. And he, on his general conduct sheet, it was two pages long. Nice. Um, I, found, I found his story to be fascinating, but sad at the same time um, in the sense that he just, he couldn't leave because he needed the money, but he wasn't happy but he stayed. Oh yeah. It was, uh, and he was confined to barracks for seven days and then another time, 14 days. And he was, you know, uh, four for seven days worth of pay, uh, for this, that, whatever he, he'd be, um, absent without leave for five days. 
so basically he's the the Raymond Massey character in 49th parallel okay if you say so <laughs> oh no he, he's 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 the guy that's deserting on the on the on the, the train and the uh the survivors of the German U-boat crew get on with them and he's like well, you're not going to escape from me and it, it happens it's, it's fantastic he's only in it for about five minutes but it's it's my oh. favorite part of Ninth parallel um to digress into movies but let's get back on on top let's talk about your women's project because that has been equally fascinating you've you've spent a lot of time looking at, at men in your work so i guess being able to write about the canadian women going to war has been has been a, a pleasant change for you it was, and I did a lot of it during the start of COVID. So again, accessing the computer for resources like find a grave, old uh, newspapers.com, uh, ancestry.ca through the library and archive. Well, it's through that. Um, I didn't have to leave my home to get this information. So someone had said to me when I was giving a talk, oh, I, I don't know, six, seven years ago, you always talk about men. What about the women? And I said, that's an excellent question. I, I said, I, I haven't really looked too much into it, but I'll see what I can do. So again, I contacted my contact at the library and archives and I said to him, uh, Kevin, like, you know, people are asking me about the women. And he said, well, no one has ever done a project on the women who died in service for Canada in World War II. I have a spreadsheet for that. If you want it. Okay. Got to so love a spreadsheet. Another spreadsheet. These, and I'm not good with spreadsheets. Like, I mean, I, <laughs> I monkey around with them, but, uh, and I can make them, but to analyze anyway. So he sent that to me and I thought, okay, this, this sounds quite interesting. So, um, and again, to access these files, the women had to have died in service. Well, what about the women who didn't die in service? So that's part two of the women's project. And that, so part one is the website um, about the women's project. And that's all the women that died in service. And they were the cooks. They were the laundresses. They were um, administrators. They were typists. They were clerks. They were waitresses. Um, they were administrators. They were evaluators. The women who had, who came from society pages, um, they were easy to find because they had a better education, a, you know, a full high school education, some university. They became the um, administrators, like way up, way up in the, in the food chain kind of thing. Um, but the women who had grade six education, grade eight education, uh, one woman, she was an orphan. Um, and she was in domestic service all her life. And then the war started and she saw this as her way of getting out of, out of this rut and being used and abused. And she became a cook, I believe. And she had bad feet, like her feet were in poor shape. Anyway, she died of an illness. I can't remember which one, but, but when she was interviewed, she wanted to stay with the army or, or with the air force. Uh, no, she might have been the army because I did army, air force and Navy, the women. Um, and she wanted to stay in the armed forces because she was treated with respect and she was getting her own wage and she could make these decisions herself. And sadly her health, uh, her health claimed her poor health claimed her women joined up for the fun of it. Um, women joined up for the service of it. Some women, uh, I'm not too sure how many, but there were some who committed suicide. Again, I'm, I'm reading these stories and I'm, I'm shocked. And the mental health aspect of things too wasn't addressed very well. Um, other women died of tuberculosis. Mm -hmm. um, I was, it, the prevalence of tuberculosis was a, a shock to me. Um, and many women died of that. There was a woman who died of a botched abortion. Uh, she got an abortion on the streets. I, I don't know which city, but um, she died of blood poisoning. Um, another woman, she had contracted tuberculosis, I think, and her she became pregnant and 
um, she was so ashamed of being pregnant and not married. I scoured the files. I was in Ottawa for this one. And I scoured the files for any inkling of who the father might have been. Nothing. And um, the baby was taken by um, family services equivalent back then. And the baby died as well um, because of, of contracting it through through the mother. Um, some women died overseas. They were sent overseas to be administrators, uh, clerk typists, um, whatever variety of jobs that they had. Some women died being struck by a bus. One woman died being struck by a bus and uh, she was distracted. And of course your buses are on different sides of the road than ours. And I think she was probably thinking I'm at home. She looked the wrong way. And the bus took her out. Another woman died on a motorcycle with her husband. No, in a Jeep, in a Jeep with her husband. They were um, coming back from having a weekend off, I guess. And they were uh, careless on the road and they rear-ended an army vehicle. And I found that story online somewhere else. And it was a romanticized story. And the the story was totally wrong. So I've corrected that woman's story. Not that I ever sent it to the person who wrote it wrong. And that's the thing, right? Whose story's right? Well, mm. I, I used what I get from the military files. Um, with regards to the Ottawa project and the America, an American came up from the California area to join up the Air Force. And his uh, resume was a little questionable when I was typing up his story. I'm like, yeah, right, sure okay, whatever. And one person said, keep an eye on this guy. Anyways, he became a pilot. He was a service pilot for a couple of years. He was then sent to Halifax, boarded the America, and he drowned. So um, I asked, and I, I didn't have a picture of him. So I asked another friend of mine and I said, do you have a picture of him? And he said, no, but I, yes, I do. I found this. And uh a person at the San Diego State University had written up profiles of the people on their cenotaph there. And it said that he was overseas and he shot, he, he, his plane was shot up and he was the only surviving person on this British aircraft. I'm like, well, that's totally wrong because then the guy never went overseas. He died before he even got there. So I tracked down who wrote that story And I contacted the San Diego State University archives, gave them the clipping that I had. They found me the original article that this man pulled from because this, this, this American had gone back down to California for on a furlough and was interviewed by the student newspaper. And he lied about what he did, but the man who wrote the story had no idea that he had lied. And so he wrote it up like it was, it happened. So I had to let this fellow know, well, he goes, well, where's your proof? So I sent him the card that lists from Manning Depot until the man's death. And he was never overseas. And I said, this proves that he's never been overseas. He says, well, I will correct that in my next uh, incarnation of this document. And he's going to check to see if the guy's even on the cenotaph, because I said, I looked at the cenotaph and I didn't even see the fellow's name. So that, that story was like, um, catch me if you can with Leonardo DiCaprio. Mm. That, that's what made me think of this fellow. And his name was John Borum. Um, fascinating story. Uh, he never was married, never had children. So um, no one's going to come back. He was the only, only child too, I think. So I, I, I don't think anyone's going to come back and wrap me over the knuckles for, for, for telling the truth. The, 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 paper, the paper trail never lies there, does it? Sometimes. Yeah. That, that's another rabbit hole that that's, let's, not, <laughs> let's not go and down back, to. Back to the women's project. Mm. I found it fascinating because I learned they did a variety of roles, as did many of the men. And again, we forget that there, these other roles had to be fulfilled. And so often we get so fixated on the major role players. We forget about the ones that were the supporters. And um, I really found that to be fascinating to see all these other jobs that were available with the Air Force, the Navy and the Army 
um, all the way through. And these people, they signed up in droves. And why did they sign up? Because they wanted to escape the life they had had, many of the women, or it was for adventure, or they needed money. Mm-hmm. And otherwise, uh, other people signed up for um, duty. Uh, uh, it was the call of, you know, it was, it was their responsibility to sign up. And I, I wonder about the youth today, if they would do the same thing. I, I think my one daughter would. Um, I don't think my son would. Right. So it's, it's a different world today, of course, but. It's interesting. Um, Paul Woodage and I were were chatting with Colin Bell, the Mosquito pilot at Chalk Valley the other year. And we raised that same point thinking, yeah, he knows his stepkids. I know, I know, I know my daughter would, and their friends for that matter, would they do it? And he just very pointedly said, if they were needed, they would say yes. And it was, it was a very interesting viewpoint of, of someone who, you know, was 18, answered the call and, and, and did it. And I suppose when you've, you've been in that situation, you, you have a slightly different perspective to it than mm-hmm. Yeah, because I know... The, the veterans that I spoke to, they said, we had to do it. There, there was a common enemy. Um, we had to do it. And, um, and I just, it's been quite a, uh, a journey for me. And I mean, uh, had I not wanted to write that story 11 years ago, and it still hasn't been written, I've got bits and pieces to it, but it's never been written. And I'm thinking, well, what kind of a pilot would I make my main character? Because first I thought, oh, he'll just be a trainer like Gordon Jones. Mm-hmm. Then I started to meet Lancaster, a Lancaster pilot, a Spitfire pilot. Oh, maybe, maybe I'll, you know, he'll be an instructor and then he'll become one of those two kind of pilots. Then I met a typhoon pilot named Harry Hardy. And that's where the slippery slope begins. That's where the slippery slope <laughs> begins. Yeah. And then I thought, you know what? After all this research, um, I guess I've learned the most about typhoon pilots as a group of human beings and as a group of men who flew this tank of the sky. Like, I mean, it was a tank, it was a flying tank, basically. And I had never heard of a typhoon. I, when I give my talks, I, I start with a little joke. And I said, when I, when I first started this uh, journey, if you asked me what a tiger moth or a mosquito were, I would have told you flying insects. <laughs> so then about a typhoon, I'm thinking, well, it's a storm. And how I got to meet this uh, amazing man named Harry Hardy, I go back to Gordon Jones, because when I was writing Gordon Jones's story, I asked him, Gordon, I need to talk to people who knew you when you were an instructor in High River. Who can I talk to? Well, Bob Spooner. Well, who's Bob Spooner? Where does he live? Oh, he's, we were instructors together uh, over in High High River. We were both instructors and uh, he was sent overseas and and he flew typhoons. Well, that just kind of went, I didn't care what he flew, but he, he was with Gordon as an instructor. Do you have his phone number? Yep. Does Gordon phone Bob? No. So I phone Bob. He lived on Vancouver Island with his wife uh, near Victoria, just uh, a bit north of Victoria, just very close to the airport. And um, I call him up, cold call. Hi, my name is, I'm writing a book about Gordon Jones. May I speak to Bob Spooner? This is him. And, um, And so I told him what I was looking for. And I said, I'd love to come out and visit. I have a girlfriend who lives in Victoria. So I would do kind of double duty, visit her and visit you at the same time. Okay. Okay. So I, I booked a, a flight and um, in the meantime, Gordon, like, I don't know if Gordon and Bob had spoken, but uh, I go out to visit Bob and he's living on his beautiful acreage um, with an ocean view towards uh, Washington state in his, his house with his wife and um, very humble home. So I start talking to Bob, writing, making notes and stuff. And I ask him, hey, well, what about you? No, this is all about Gordon. Well, we're we're only going to focus about Gordon. So I went out two or three times 
talk to him on the phone. And once I got Gordon's book pretty much formatted and ready to go, uh, I continued to go out to Victoria to visit my friend out there. And I was giving talks at the British Columbia Aviation Museum about Gordon and Bob would kindly come to my talks. And um, I was visiting him one day and he said he finally agreed to talk to me about his time in the war. And he says, would you like to look into my, would you like to come and see my typhoon room? Okay. So he opens this door and it's the twin guest bedroom, but inside this twin guest bedroom is typhoon photographs all over the walls, typhoon models, typhoon everything. And he's moving stuff around and um, Bob Spooner earned the DFC. He was uh, part of 438 squadron and uh he he said the only he says i don't know why you're in the dfc it wasn't for one thing he said I, I just did my duty it was a bunch of stuff but he said everyone was getting killed off and so the next guy in line was bob spooner so he became you know he he, he started to rise up the the level that the totem pole so to speak and um he would bob would start talking to me about uh typhoon reunions and typhoon field trips and typhoon barbecues and typhoon luncheons. And this guy in mainland Vancouver, like in Burnaby, BC was the organizer of it. Oh, okay. Again, I just kind of put that to the side. So I continued to stay in touch with Bob. We came, became uh, nice friends and um, sadly Bob passed away in 2016, July, 2016. And his family contacted me and asked me, if I would come out for the funeral and speak at Bob's funeral, which was such an honor. So I did, I flew out the first, the earliest flight I did. It was a fly in, fly out thing. First flight in, last flight out. Went to the car, went to my girlfriend. She, she got to know Bob as well because of my talks. And um, so we went to the, the memorial service and I gave my two minute, I was granted two minutes and I practiced it and I gave my talk. It was the reception. And I see during the reception, they had Bob's log book and photographs and his blue jacket for the air crew association. And, you know, lots of paraphernalia of his, his wartime beyond, he was a barbershop court, like he sang in a barbershop group and he loved to fish and, so anyway, there was an older gentleman with a blue jacket and a walker. And I said to Susan, my girlfriend, I gotta, I gotta go talk to this guy. So I go and I introduce myself. He goes, I know who you are. Cause he saw me give the talk about Bob. And I said, well, who are you? And he says, my name is Harry Hardy. And he says, I'm the one who organizes, organized all the barbecues and the luncheons and the reunions. And then it twigs. So I asked him if I could have my picture taken with him. Susan took my picture with him and he slips his arm around my waist. <laughs> and he's got this little twinkle in his eye. And I'm like, uh oh, he's trouble. So um, I said, can I get your uh, contact information? I only have fax and the telephone and Canada Post. Okay. Do you have a fax machine, Ann? Nope. Well, that's how I do my business, fax machine. Well, sorry, Harry, I don't have a fax machine. So I don't know how many months went by. I had a question and I thought, Harry's the guy to ask. So I phoned him up out of the blue. He knew exactly who I was. He says, I never thought I'd ever hear from you again. <laughs> <laughs> and he knew I, Bob must have told him about Gordon Jones's book. And over the course of my conversations with Harry, he, uh, he says, I want you to write a book about the typhoons, about the typhooners. And I said, uh, I, I don't know. And I said, and then I found out that there's a book called Typhoon and Tempest by Hugh Halliday. And I'm like, well, Harry, a book's already been written about the, the typhoon. Why, why would I write a, another book? Because that, that is the go-to book. And I, I have to say, I've, I've referred to it. And Harry gifted me his copy of the book. I don't know, Matt, if you, do you have this book? I, 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 I have, I have it here. You do. Yes. There you go. It's fantastic. It's a fabulous, it's a fabulous book. So um, 
I said, no, Harry. Um, I said, if, if, how many typhoon pilots are there? Oh, 300 and some. I said, that's one page. That's 300 pages. Uh, that's a, that's a, it's going to weigh a ton, Harry. And I said, it takes a long time to write a book. And I said, who's going to buy it? I will. He says, well, <laughs> well, Harry, no. So then I thought I'll do a website instead. So I knew nothing about creating a website. So that was my first website. And I had to uh, access a friend's expertise and he set up the framework. And then I had to learn computer coding and uh, all this stuff. So uh, amazing, amazing experience that way. And um, because Harry had no internet at his house, when I would visit him in Burnaby, uh, and he insisted that I stay with him at his home, um, I'd have to then take him to a Starbucks and, and get access so he could start seeing what the website was starting to look like. And he loved it. He was like a kid in the candy store. I had to teach him how to, you know, touch the, the button and how to, you know, navigate it a little bit. And then uh, over the course of, so I guess I started to visit him in maybe 2017. Sadly, Harry passed away uh, in May, 2020. Uh, he was 98. He was almost 99. Um, he wanted to be the last surviving Canadian typhoon pilot. And he goes, and I gave him this look. He goes, I know, I know what that means. But that's what he wanted. Well, he wasn't. Uh, Curry Gardner, I believe, is still, the, is still alive at 103 in Toronto. But Harry's mobility was starting to decline and um, bringing him in. Uh, he loved to go on little field trips, but he was... He's a bit, he was a big man. He was tall, very tall. And he had his walker and oxygen and things. So it was a bit of a haul to get him in and out of the house, into the car, out of the car, into his wheelchair. Goodness gracious. Um, so I asked his neighbor next door if we could pony off his web, off his uh, Wi-Fi. And he let me. So I was able to show Harry in his home um, as as the website has continued to grow. So there's over 300 men's names on there. And Harry was stress, stressing to me, it's not just the pilots. We had ground crew and he said, they are the unsung heroes too. He said, they, they were so important to our success. So he says, you have to talk about them too. So I, I put it, there's a few fellas there um, who were, um, aero engine mechanics, um, a variety of different positions there, but he said they were so critical to moving them from base to base to base. And Harry was with 440 Squadron. So of all the, all the Air Force squadrons that I know, I know the Typhoon Canadian ones, 438, 439, and 440. <laughs> Don't ask me about the other ones. I can't, I can't tell you that. I, I keep telling people I am not a rivet counter. I am a storyteller. And, and just, just to say, there's nothing wrong with those of us who are rivet counters. No, so. nothing. No, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely not. Don't ask me what horsepower a typhoon has. I, I, I can read it off. A, you know, if you want to know that, go to the internet or go to Typhoon and Tempest because yeah. you can find out. Um, that 2,250, is but we, we, we weren't. We okay. <laughs> I don't know how. Yeah. So, um, but like I said, I, I had to stop visiting Harry because COVID came up and his health was declining. The last time I saw Harry was in December 2018, I think 20. Anyways, his mind was starting to slide and he was um, so wrapped up back into his mechanical engineering um, thoughts. And um, he had his good hours and kind of struggled hours. He still loved having me there because I was cooking for him. He, he was a widower and um, he loved me cooking. And, um, and I, was, I was doing a bit of cleaning in his house too. But um, he, he says, I, I, you know, I, I wrung him dry of his stories, but he would write to me um on a weekly basis and he would tell me stories like he gave me the horsepower all that other kind of stuff about the like he gave me the basics to start with and how they how 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 they did their formations and how they trained and 
Um, he told me about some men that were very important to him that he lost overseas, Buck Genvy being one of them. Um, it's quite a story. And Buck was shot down. Harry saw his friend shot down and Harry flew over him and Buck waved to him. And he said, that's the last I saw of him. And he said, every Remembrance Day, I think of Buck Genvy waving to me. And Buck was then taken in by the resistance and hidden for, I'm not too sure how long. Anyways, there was a traitor in the resistance and he was um, found out. There was a struggle and Buck was shot. And the family that housed him wrote a letter to Mrs. Genvy explaining to her what, um, what a wonderful man Buck Genvy was. And Harry was like in awe of, like he was, almost, Buck Genvy was like a hero to Harry. He had taken him as un, under his wing uh, when Harry was a new pilot on the squadron and was able to look his files up in Ottawa. Quite a story. And Harry wanted me to be the promoter of the typhoon. Well, Harry was a promoter himself. There are, if anyone was to Google Harry Hardy, um, typhoon pilot, there are some videos on YouTube. Uh, there's a series of three of them. And he's telling the story of the typhoon in three parts. And it's fabulous. You can see Harry talking. Um, one of my favorite uh, YouTube videos of Harry, his grandson, uh, is in the movie film industry in Vancouver and he knew a songwriter who needed a veteran for his song and Harry's in that one and the song is beautiful I can't remember the name of it right now but um, Harry lights candles for veterans from Afghanistan more modern uh, veterans I, I get all teared up when I when I see that one um, so Harry Harry was the instigator for the typhoon project if it wasn't for him, there wouldn't be a typhoon project uh, on the internet. And I have to say, I've made international connections through that typhoon project, Holland, Belgium, the United States, Canada, of course, England, um, other countries too. A fellow from Belgium last week contacted me. He said I had misspelled um, a Belgian's, he, this Belgian had joined the Air, uh, Royal Canadian Air Force and I had misspelled his middle name and he sent me scads and scads of photographs and documents related to this Belgian who joined the Royal Canadian Air Force. So I, I fixed the spelling and I was able to add more photographs uh, to this man's Sozman. A very, a very famous Belgian typhoon pilot. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I added more photos to him, his page uh, just the other day. So every so often, I, I last week I received a letter, uh, an email from a woman in Holland. Her name is Alice and they do, uh, it's, a, it's a cemetery project and mm -hmm. she wanted one of the stories. And I said to her, take it off the website. I said, it's meant to be shared. It's not my story. Sure. I wrote it up, but take it. She goes, oh, that's great. We don't have to, we don't have to rewrite it. Of course not, Alice. Take it, re rewrite it. There's, there's no copyright on my website. I mean. <laughs> the, the, the Dutch are amazing because they, they're, they're school kids and, and the Belgians as well. They will, they will adopt, adopt the graves and, and take mm -hmm. care of them if they're in the local towns. And uh, it's, I, I was, I, I was a kid in a candy shop when I saw your update that all of the, the extra pictures of Pierre was because the Belgians of 609 are a legendary group with the, uh, windmill charlie de moulin's memoir being one of my favorites um, so i i was I, I i may have even squealed when i saw that pop up on on, on well Facebook. i'm glad <laughs> i i i'm really really pleased and i know harry would be really happy about it too a colleague of mine in australia uh, he's a writer as well he and i he does the kind of the military side of the the nuts and bolts the rivet counting mm -hmm. part and i do the human side of the story and we combine them so we, we were published in German magazines, British magazines, and Canadian magazines, all about the typhoon. And Harry was just so happy. So, so happy. And then I, uh, I knew, I knew a, a Spitfire pilot here in Calgary, Gordon Hill. And he was, he's connected to the hurricane project here in Calgary too, because he flew that hurricane. Just a lovely gentleman. He passed away of COVID um, this spring. Oh, cool. And I used to talk to him on a regular basis too. He was just a dear. Oh my gosh. Anyway, um, 
Harry would say to me, you leave those prima donnas alone and you focus on the typhoon. So I would tell Gordon that and then Gordon would laugh and then I'd, he'd say something and I'd pass it on to Harry. So there was this little banter back and forth between the Spitfire pilot and the typhoon pilot here in Cal well, Calgary and Burnaby. And I wrote a story called the Tiffy and the Pit, the Tiffy and the Spit or the Spit and the Tiffy. I don't know who got first billing there, but I quoted both of those men and a few other Spitfire Typhoon pilots throughout the article and they were complimenting each other for the roles and they, they said we had different roles totally different roles in the war but they they had a great deal of respect for each other absolutely I've learned so much in the past 11 years and it's all because of this fictional story that I haven't written and I've written factual stories and the men are happy to have had their stories in print their families are happy to have their family member stories most of them 95 percent um <laughs> in print and people people are saying to me without you and those stories would not be recorded and i i suppose not i would hope that maybe somebody else would have done it instead of me but I, I don't know but it's been such an honor to record the stories from a first-hand point of view and it's been an honor to create these three websites uh, in honor of those who died and that's the thing I love about your work is you include all these these so very human stories as well which 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 makes these which, you know, for, for a lot of us looking to uh, just a name in a, an operational records book, so much more. And, and I can't thank you enough for your work, especially on the typhoons. And to be able to share some stories about Harry, because he was here on mine. And like we were saying before, I have a little model of his pulverizer on my desk. And uh, it's it's been an absolute joy to, to finally get to spend some time chatting with you. So thank you for putting up with me for the last little while. Well, thank you for listening to my stories. I, I hope that um, I hope that they've been interesting and people will check out um, the three websites and uh, check out the website at the Bomber Command Museum in Nanton. And um, uh, I always have to put a plug for my books. They're available through the museum and they're available through me. Um, and uh, I like I like them selling through the museum because um, they take care of all the postage and, and stuff like that. But it's I appreciate that. It's always handy that bit. <laughs> Pardon me? It's always handy that bit. It is. And I thank you for inviting me to uh, be part and parcel of your podcast. Thank you so much. And I'm going to say, don't stop. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. <laughs> I'd like to thank Anne one more time for joining us here on History Hacks Hedge Hopping. I've put the links to the World War II Women's Project, the Ottawa Memorial Project, and of course the Typhoon Project in the description below. So please have a look at those three incredible websites. They're an amazing resource. And also we've put the link up there to the Bomber Command Museum in Nanton, Alberta, where they're doing incredible work for the men of Bomber Command and the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan. So until next time, I'd just like to say one more time, Thank you so much for listening. When our guests join us to talk about their work and their new book, the 45 minutes or so they spend with us is just a taster of all their efforts. So to this end, we have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org, where you can find our guests' latest and greatest books. You can support them and you can support History Hack too. 10% of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep at it and bring you more amazing guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash history hack or just search on bookshop.org for us under the shops bit. Thank you for your continued support and here's to your next great book.